am Leon Fergus and I'm James's brother. What happened to him is, it's horrid really. I still not like to always there for us. It doesn't really get easy, but we've gotten used to it. I'm Tom Fergus, James's brother. It's heart wrenching, isn't it, really? I should have had another older brother with me now. I'm Michael Fergus, James's brother. He's always been part of the family, he's never not been part of the family. We have a spare chair around the Christmas table, it's always been empty. My mum likes to see James's, not sitting there, but being there in presence with us, obviously while we're having Christmas dinner. What happens it is sickening, isn't it, to my own brother? Police searching for a missing two-year-old boy on Merseyside believe he's been abducted. Oh, I've had a turn left. I've got James back. The idea that it could be done by juveniles or even children was, you know, was off the scale. Was he able to talk? Yeah. James? Yeah. What did you say to him? <laughs> I had 24 years, police service at that time. I've arrested quite a few kids, but I've never dealt with a child with committed murder. Security cameras caught him on film leaving the centre with two boys. This could be any child, you know, it could have happened to anybody. Inch by inch, the police have searched the railway line where two-year-old James Dolger's body was found yesterday. I remember just feeling sick to the pit of my stomach. I thought, oh, please, God, this can't be true. Still, now I can't really fathom thinking about exactly what happened. I don't really want to know all the details about it. We do think about him. What then to the to James? It's unimaginable. We got no witnesses whatsoever to the final violence act, but there was one desire, and that was to get to the truth. It was a case of trying to extract some kind of information about how did James get all these injuries. I shouldn't have let go of his hands. It is hard for me to say, but it's the truth. I shouldn't have let go. When you have a murder investigation, you always feel desire and pressure to get to the truth and get to what happened uh, as soon as possible. At the arrest point, they were just two of the suspects that we treat as we find them. You know, there's no moment of euphoria. Yeah, we've got them because you've got everything we need here and now. We, we certainly didn't. There was one desire and that was to get to the truth. When you arrest a young child, something horrendous as it was, you've got to try and build a friendship. Otherwise, they'd oppose you and would not speak to you at all. This interview has been tape recorded. I'm Detective Sergeant Roberts. Now, what's your full name? Robert Thompson. Robert Thompson's interviews, he admitted quicker. He was in the strand. I think at one stage, really early on, he says he saw James with his mother. Uh, that's all he saw. Who was he with? No. Little James. With his mum. With his mum. You report back to Marsh Lane, and they all, did we have the right kids? And I just said, listen, don't ask me that. 
I said, I haven't got a clue at the moment. If I get the feeling, I'll tell you. And then his interviews quite quickly get to the stage where he has uh, John taking his hand and, and taking him out. You see, little James is following you up on stage, right? Mm. But on another picture, John, it appears as if John had hold of his hand. Yeah, well, why, why are you questioning me and, and John as well? There was nothing coming from Edibles, but he was a different character altogether. Well, we knew Venables had been in the Strand, and it was admitted that Venables and Thompson were together, so, so we knew, even before we started interviewing them, that they'd been in the Strand. The first and second interview, Venables just told us about how he was playing through and getting up to mischief in and around Walton, County Road, never been near the Strand. He said that the two of you were in the strand and that you saw the little boy. We never. We never. He's taking us around everywhere he went, but he's, he's not volunteering anything in relation to the strand. And when he gets asked about the strand, he just told us he was basically here, there and everywhere around Walton, shoplifting and getting up to no good. The God knows the truth. God knows the truth. I'm telling you, and he never. He was too scared. He was probably too scared. John saying to us that he wasn't down at the Strand. Okay. I know you were at the Strand, but why should he lie to us by saying that he wasn't in the Strand? He's scared of saying that he was down in the Strand because something happened. Didn't they? After they got to? Yeah. Not by me. I'm Dominic Lloyd. I was Robert Thompson's solicitor at the time of the case. This is a ten-year-old boy. A couple of months before this offence, he couldn't have been found guilty of a criminal offence in this country under the law that it was at the time. He'd never been in police custody before. He didn't know the ropes. This wasn't a streetwise, sophisticated young criminal who was adept at handling the police, as has been suggested. I just didn't see any evidence of that at all. I saw a frightened young boy who was putting up shutters. I know the truth. I believe so I know the I, truth. I was there. That's right. You went. Correct, but I know there are a lot of things that have gone on. Yeah, well, do you know it was me that killed him? It wasn't. <laughs> My name is Laurie Dalton. I was a detective constable for 26 years. Thompson was calculating. He cried whenever there was an awkward situation and he was immediately given a Mars bar and a can of Coke and he latched onto this. Because when I say he cried, there was not a drop of water. There wasn't a tear. The boy was streetwise. He was trying to calm me. He thought he was going home. Because he kept on asking, well, am I going home? 2055. We don't know yet. We don't know yet. And I want you to tell me. I don't need to answer any more questions, do I? Hey, come on now, Bobby. Yeah, well, I want to kill a man, I've got a baby of my own. I'm trying I to... I wanted to kill a baby, I killed my own, wasn't I? That is a warped mind. Very rare in kids' minds. It's a chilling thing to say with hindsight. At the time, it simply seemed to be part of a pattern of desperate lying, of desperately just trying to talk about anything else other than this. He was working the police, basically, or he believed he was. Phil Roberts knew exactly what was going on. Was he able to talk? Yeah. James? Yeah. What did he say to you? I want me to... That's quite a bit cold, very eerie, the fact 
that he actually said it in the way James would have said it. Once he started to admit that he was the one with Venables to lead the Strand, that's when your heart is pumping and you feel like punching the air. And then admitting that he was the, one of the two boys that was with James, that's when you're feeling excited, back up. Achievement that you've abstracted what you want. Now you want to go further. At the end of interview three, which was the last interview on the first night, he was arrested, which had been the Thursday. We tell him that Robert Thompson has already told us that he's been in the strand. And then he admits being in the strand. Yeah, we was, but we never saw any kids there. We never robbed any kids. <coughs> so you were in Bootle, you strand? Yeah, was you in Bootle Strand? Yeah, we never got a kid, Mum. We never, we never got a kid. I must ask you that to get angry with it. John Venables was frightened of upsetting his mother. They put it to me that it might be worth having a word with Susan Venables. Susan just, you know, said to him, look, you know, we'll always love you, we'll always support you. You really need to tell the truth. And so that was the breakthrough then that led to the next interview. A short while ago, as is detailed on your custody record out there, you had a conversation with your mum and you then requested that myself come into the room. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And what was it you told us? Thank you, James. You know, he, he actually said those words, you know, I killed him. In a private room, his mother sat with John and basically said, you need to tell the truth, we'll support you, don't be worrying, and, and basically he said, I killed James, I killed him. And that was the first and probably only admission. A short while ago, as is detailed on your custody record out there, you had a conversation with your mum and you then requested that myself come into the room. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And what was it you told us? Thank you, James. It was really difficult to consider that anybody could carry out those type of injuries to another individual. The idea that it could be someone as young as 10 was difficult to comprehend. That was, you know, the breakthrough then that led to the next interview, which was interview six, I think, which then probably was as close as you're going to get to the truth, where John Benables then took the interviews through the Friday, or they took James. We went outside to take him out. What for? So, and we said, let's have thrown him in the water. He was persuading him, he said, kneel down, let's look at the water and all that, but he wouldn't. Because when we wouldn't get him down, Robert kicked him up and threw him on the floor, and that's where he got his bump on his head. This then became the difficult part, because now we've got two ten-year-olds who have killed a two-year-old, and we have to then make sure that we provide all the evidence that we can to show what happened. 
we got a sense of what sort of went on on the journey. They walked him past Queen's Drive, past Christchurch, took him onto the reservoir. Why had you carried on walking away with him up to the reservoir? Taking him up to Wotton Village. What were you going to, why were you taking him up to Wotton Village? Don't know, he didn't know what to do. You walk along where? The train track. We got no witnesses whatsoever to the final violent act. Our priority was solely to discover what happened to James. We took him on the rail truck. We started throwing bricks at him. Benables sought to remove himself from any of the most violent actions, putting them all down to Robert Thompson saying that I only hit him a, a few times because Robbie told me to do it, but, you know, I didn't do it really hard. I didn't throw any bricks because Robbie said pick up your cotton and throw it and just threw it on the floor. We were getting information coming through from a lower lane where Venables was being held that uh, he was now blaming Thompson. We certainly admitted throwing stones and things like that. But he's blaming you for a lot of things. Yeah, why you understand? Is he me? Well, I want to know the truth, right? Now. The whole truth. There's other things going on, isn't it? They both started blaming each other. We're asking you, son, and we want you to tell us to discuss the truth, that's all. Not give the blame to you or anything else. But it, it's only the truth that we're yeah, concerned we're about. Because he knew there was only him, Venables and James, he knew that it would be hard for me to say who did what. And that's why it was easier for him to blame it all on Venables. Can we just go through slowly, right, what John did with what, right? Yeah. You said he got hit with a brick first, didn't he? Then, what did he do? Another brick. He threw another brick. These are the boys that took James from Denise outside the Strand and then left him where he died. That actually ultimately killed him. We had the individual responsible. What was Robert saying while he was doing all this? He was saying, stay down, stupid dick and bring him over. Why do you want him to stay down? I don't know. I wanted him dead properly. Where did the stones in the bar hit him? In the head. And you said the bar knocked him out? Yeah. Onto the railway track. And what happened then? No, he was just lying there. To finish now because I can't speak anymore. By the time the interviews are over, John has made an admission. Robert hasn't and said it was all John. And John has tried to push and blame in Robert's direction. And that was the point at which we left the police interviews. And that remained the case throughout the time that I was acting for him through to trial. That story didn't change. We had enough evidence. Once we have enough evidence, we charge. A 10 year old boy standing on the other side of the charge desk. He can't even reach the top of the desk. 
And when he got charged, I thought, how could you, as a 10 year old boy, cause so much misery to a person's life? My name's Ray Simpson. I was the inspector in Merseyside Police Press Office at the time. It was just solid with reporters. Camera crews, all the satellites were outside. By this time, I mean, it was worldwide. Two 10-year-old boys from the Walton area have been charged with the abduction and murder of James Bulger. Well, I was kind of relieved because I knew that they couldn't go and take another child because I, I strongly believe that they were in course when they were, they would have gone on to do because they would have got away with it. From early this morning, local people, still furious at the death of James Bulger, began to gather outside South Sefton Magistrates Court. So less than two weeks since James had been abducted, there was a degree of anger on the streets which was frightening. It was frightening. You want to give them to the people and let them sort them out? I've heard reports between three and 500. It's not far off and they wanted blood. They really did. Let them go, they chanted. To say that emotions ran high would be an understatement. Bastard! There were some fairly violent scenes as people tried to rush at the police vans and arrests were made. It was generally a very difficult scene. My name is Diane Halliwell, and at the time of the investigation, I was a press officer for Merseyside Police. We went into the court, and then the boys were brought in. John Venables was with his father, and Robert Thompson was with a social worker. And as we sat at the back, I think we were shocked that they were only 10, but actually seeing the boys, they were tiny, you could barely see them above the desk. I don't know what I imagined I was going to see when those two boys came into court, you know, what kind of monsters I'd conjured up in my mind, but you couldn't have expected to see anything more ordinary and more unprepossessing than these two tiny little boys looking very lost and bewildered who, who were led into the courtroom. And that was the shocking thing. You couldn't believe, looking at little boys like that, that they'd done that to James. It was just so hard to believe. My name is Sean Sexton. I'm a solicitor in Liverpool. I was brought in to help Denise and the family. It was the Friday before James's funeral on the Monday, and I got a phone call from uh, a Sunday tabloid newspaper, uh, and they told me they were going to run a story on the Sunday that um, Denise had been shoplifting on the day of James' abduction, and she delayed reporting James missing uh, so she could uh, stash the loot. I wasn't aware that people were saying nasty things about me. I've never shoplifted or anything like that, and anyone who knows me knows that. So all these people, or the people that are claiming these nasty things about me, they weren't there. You look at the CCTV, Denise is paying at the counter. Um, whatever. She turns around and James is gone. It was very hurtful to the family as if they needed any more hurt at that time. And it was utter nonsense. It 
a really cold morning, bitterly cold. I was travelling in a car and the crowds were sort of like two or three deep all the way along. It was a massive funeral. There were people lining the route. When I got off the funeral car, I just seen two sides of the road lined with people, but I just put my head back down because I just wanted the day to be over. When the tiny white coffin came in, it was just really, really moving. And at the front of the church, there was a red armchair that the dad had made, Ralph had made, and for James, and that was just really, really sad. And Father Michael's address was, you know, sitting there and you'll be sitting with our Lord now in heaven. It was just really, really sad. Something in James Patrick has touched the whole world. We wish so much that we could bring James back. Tragic. Um, I mean, the, you, you can see the pictures of the, of the actual funeral itself, and there's rows and rows of people uh, just in tears. It was a beautiful service, and Denise was very dignified. She'd been told um, probably best to buy a hat so she could be private in her grief, and throughout it all, she had a wide-brimmed hat on. She kept her head down. I also kept thinking, I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't have to do this. I should not be putting my child down there. I think the Kirby community, you know, James was from Kirby, it was a real sense of loss because you, you felt it was like your own, really. That's the way I felt. There were times when you just looked back at it and thought, what a waste. And it was. In two separate police vans, the youngest defendants to face murder charges this century arrived at Preston Crown Court this morning. We all knew, and the court officials all knew, this wasn't an everyday court case that would get reported in the local paper. This was a major international story of the grimmest sort. I felt that the boys had to go to trial, regardless of the ages, because the family deserved that. The family deserved the fact that they could be seen to be on trial. A conviction was out of our control, really, but we sought a conviction because that would be the justice that the Bulger family deserved. I just wanted them to spend many years behind bars. That's someone's child that they've taken and they can't get away with it. Police and lawyers have spent the nine months since James Bulger's death gathering evidence for the case. We'd done everything we could do. We, we presented the file of evidence to the best of our ability. Richard Henriquez, Queen's Counsel, leading prosecuting counsel. I felt more emotionally involved than I have done in any other case. It was a courtroom I was very familiar with, and seeing two 11-year-olds in that uh, dock was a shock in itself.
It was an extraordinary spectacle, really, to see all this legal majesty surround these two little tiny boys. In relation to Robert, I think he was frightened of it. I think he was frightened of getting there. I think he was frightened of getting into the court building. He understood that there would be enormous attention on the trial. There would be crowds outside court and they would be likely to make attempts at the vehicle he was in. The fact that the boys were intimidated, well, at the end of the day, they did what they did. And if, if, if they were then scared by going into court, well, tough. <laughs> you know, he just didn't. I've got very little sympathy with them in terms of, oh, it was such a terrible time, I, I felt so scared in court and everything. Well, they brought it on themselves and hard lines. Strangely, the critical evidence of joint enterprise and involvement in the crime didn't come from the railway line at all, but it came from that very long walk from Bootle to Walton, two and a half miles through a residential area, and uh, decent, responsible people wanted to help and uh, offered help. The witnesses that actually appeared got very, very upset because I think they felt such guilt at not being able to stop it and the fact that they, they hadn't actually intervened to the point where they'd taken James off these two boys. James was apparently seen by dozens of people on his journey. Eleven of them came to court today. Many said they thought he was with older brothers. I don't blame them witnesses whatsoever. Yeah, he could have been saved by one, maybe more, but no one expects a two ten-year-old to take a child and do what they've done. Every time there were actually questions as to what they were doing or where they were going or who James was, they had the stories ready. The story changed along the way but they would give explanations to the people who were actually speaking to them as to what they were doing with James, where they were going, why he was crying, why he got a graze on his head. And they had so many opportunities along the way to perhaps give James up to the people. I am convinced that they had one intention and that was intention to kill him. They've walked James for three miles and then taken him to the railway track. They just plain evil. The forensic evidence was chilling. The pathologist evidence was that I think uh, 42 separate injuries to James, a minimum of 30 separate blows, either with bricks, stones, a metal object, or feet to the body of James. 
So it was a prolonged, shockingly violent attack, uh, which um, frankly could uh, have had no other purpose uh, other than to kill. That was a really difficult thing to listen to. And there was real emotion. I mean, I think a lot of the forensic experts had given evidence in dozens, if not hundreds, of trials. And it's pretty matter of fact for them. But it's not matter of fact if the victim is two years old. I don't think any of them tried to hide the fact this was an unusually distressing experience to give evidence. Thompson's trainers had been removed uh, without untying the laces. The police had seized his trainers. They were able to take an imprint of the laces as they were tied. It was a double bow. Uh, there were some very marked uh, D-rings, they were called, um, through which the laces had been laced. The evidence as to why these marks were made by Robert's footwear and ultimately the evidence concluded where the scientist had taken a, a life-size doll and the footwear and placed the footwear in contact with the doll's head where it would make the impression that was visible. That was a moment of clarity for me, yeah, yeah. I had had, by that time, quite a long relationship with him, and during which time he had denied all involvement, and to be presented with, with a picture like that didn't break my relationship. Um, it just meant that I had to... I had to be aware that there was something else in it now. Yeah. We investigated it over a period of nine months. We understood it. The evidence tells us what Thompson and Venables did. They acted with a purpose. They acted with precision. And they inflicted deadly injuries in a manner that's just uh, beyond words. No one could believe that two 10-year-olds could do something like that, It'd be so evil on another child. The two of them were as evil as each other. So I strongly believe if they would have got away with James's murder, they would have gone on to commit another crime. They would have gone on to take another child and do the same to that child. Nearly four weeks she has stayed away, but this morning, for the final stages of the trial of two 11-year-old boys accused of the murder of her toddler, Mrs. Denise Bulger came in person to Preston Crown Court. I wanted to hear the sentence that they were given. That experience in itself, you know, sitting so close to the two that took my son's life, took my world away from me, destroyed my life. It was so close to me. I couldn't believe that they were standing there laughing. You just want to see the ones who took your wheels away from you go down.
It was an absolutely packed court. You could have cut the atmosphere um, with a knife. There was always a worry at the back of their minds that, you know, maybe the jury couldn't get beyond their age. Um, maybe the jury would, would, would try and find some way to avoid an actual conviction for murder. You could see in the jury the weight of responsibility. Some of the faces were really, they were carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders. The form of the jury was asked if they had reached verdicts on the abduction of James Bulger, on the murder of James Bulger. Uh, have you reached verdicts? Yes, they had. Had there been a, an acquittal, the, the competence of our criminal justice process would have been seriously questioned. At that point, the judge decided that was you know, enough to, to proceed, and uh, he took the verdict. Guilty. found them guilty. You almost feel the breath that had been held in, which exhaled throughout the, that courtroom. I remember the family at the back, and you know, yes, when the, the verdict came in. I remember just feeling a big sense of relief. Robert Thompson was gasping for air. He was in a state of absolute shock. John Venables was crying. It was a, a moment of the most terrible drama. The verdict coming was a relief because it gave the Bullsey family the, 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 the justice that, you know, I think they deserved and I think it was the right verdict. One by one, he delivered the guilty verdicts against child A and child B, first for the abduction and secondly for the murder of James. So we refer to them as child A and child B for, for all the reasons that you have protocols around the protection of children. Thompson was A and Venables was B. The judge then decided upon conviction that he would release the names. We were very happy that that they were named because what they did, they deserved to be named. They could have been allowed to fade into obscurity, um, but the family didn't want that. When Robert Thompson and John Venables were driven off into custody, he'd sentenced them to detention at Her Majesty's pleasure and told them they'd be locked away for a very long time to come. I remember the judge, at the end of it, he said, you will both save very, very many years in prison. And I was, I was pleased with that outcome. I found out a few weeks later that very, very many years meant eight years. That's not what I thought was going to happen. I do remember thinking, how am I going to tell Denise this? Like, that's not very, very many years. And then I said, well, don't worry, sir, because the Lord Chief Justice is going to have his say now. And, you know, I can't believe he'll go along with eight years, too. And the Lord Chief Justice came back with ten years. And, and that just, you know, really felt like an insult for, for the family. So um, that's when they decided that they were going to raise this petition because the final decision was going to be made by the Home Secretary. Michael Howard, I was, uh, I was Home Secretary. Ralph and Denise Bulger and baby Michael arriving at the Home Office to demand that James's killers be locked up for life, backed up by a petition bearing more than a quarter of a million signatures. I had to consider what I thought was the appropriate sentence. Trial judge said eight years. The Lord Chief Justice had said 10 years. 
I had in the forefront of my mind those words of the trial judge. This was an act of unparalleled evil and barbarity. I tried to work out what an adult would have had as a sentence. My thought would have been um, well in excess of 20 years. Obviously, you, you, you had to discount from that because the offenders were, were very young and you, you obviously had to take that into account. And um, I thought 15 years was, was the right sentence. Michael Howard did up the sentence to 15 years, although I still wasn't happy, but I was prepared to accept because they would have been spending time in a proper prison um, once they come out of the young offenders. The petition backfired. The boys challenged it. defeat for the Home Secretary at the hands of the judges. He shouldn't have been swayed by petitions collected by the Bulger family and a campaign run by the Sun newspaper which called for the boys to spend the rest of their lives in jail. The petition, people forget, um, called for um, Venables and Thompson to be imprisoned for life. So it didn't really take the petition for me to know what kind of reaction this, this terrible crime had evoked. It was decided that the Lord Chief Justice would decide the tariff in those cases. And he came out with seven years, eight months. That wasn't just a kick in the teeth, it was a stab in the back. I thought, you know, James's life didn't mean anything then. 15 years would have meant that they did some time in jail. And if that had happened, I think a lot of the pain that is still there w wouldn't be there now. If they'd done some time in jail, if they'd heard the clang of the prison gates, then I think there would have been some feeling that, well, you know what? they were punished. But all they did was spend time in a secure children's home. They were in a children's home. They never spent one day in a young offenders institution, never mind an adult prison. I wanted justice for James. I wanted them to, to save a long time in an adult prison. Young offenders is not gonna learn them that what they've done was wrong can't get away with murder. That's someone's child that they've taken and they can't get away with it. thought, you know, James's life didn't mean anything then. You know, they're not, they're not even going to reach an adult prison. They should have gone to an adult prison. My name is Amanda Knowles, and I was the Children's Resource Centre Manager at Barton Mosque. I would see Robert on the unit, but every month I would see him in that formal setting of, of a secure unit review. He would sit curled up in his chair, sucking his thumb. It, it's like he'd regressed. 
you know, because he knew that what he'd done was very serious and he wouldn't be going back to his mum anytime soon. My name is David James Smith. I did a great deal of research, tracking back into the boys' backgrounds. In Robert's case, he was truanting a lot, and I think has been described as an urban feral child, just left to you know roam around the streets and in and out of the shops and the pubs, and you know just generally out of control. I don't hold the view that children are born evil. Some staff had real difficulties with that in the beginning, uh, coming to terms with, you know, what Robert had done. But with the help and support of psychologists, they were able to um, provide the care that enabled Robert to be successfully rehabilitated and returned to, you know, to, to society. I did spend a little bit of time uh, at Red Bank and came into contact with, with, with John. He definitely appeared to have more complex needs as a professional that worked with, with children for a long time. I would have been questioning things like learning difficulties, history of abuse, how this might be manifesting in his, in his behaviour, because that was visible in his appearance. When I looked at Robert and John, I saw in John a boy that was more troubled than Robert. I suppose that the word you'd use is he looked more disturbed. He and Robert would both have been uh, uh, so unbelievably scrutinised. So their every actions were kind of recorded. There are all these sort of tear sheets, daily sheets, where you know almost hour by hour people are making notes about what they're up to. I sat at the dining table with John. We were joking about fighting, and I said something to the effect that he couldn't pull the skin off a rice pudding. He replied, "Oh yeah, bring your baby here, and I'll batter it." John Venable's parents had had difficulties with depression. The police had been called once because Susan Venables had left her children unattended. She had issues with alcohol and that she came from a family in which there was, you know, known to be domestic violence. There's loads of kids out there who come from bad upbringings and, you know, bad family backgrounds and stuff like that. I don't care whether they were bad uproars, that didn't give them the right to go out and take the life of a child, my child. I was just crying uncontrollably. I was just, I couldn't believe it. I thought, you haven't been punished for murdering my son yet. There you are, about to live new lives now. I just couldn't believe it. I, I didn't think they would have been really so soon. I felt like I'd let James down. I didn't think I'd, I fought hard enough. The two killers are 18 now but their images are frozen in time, and that's the way it'll remain. And the first thoughts I had is, I've got a lot of nieces that go into town. You know, one of them could have been getting chatted up by him. Who knows? He could have took it to his house or vice versa. And it was a scary thought that I had. And when I had the conversation with my nieces, they were all taken back by going, never even thought about that. So, yeah, it was a big concern for my family.
last night, the Ministry of Justice revealed that Venables, now 27, was for the first time in an adult prison. released he was in the charge of a probation officer and uh, his life was you know began to descend into chaos he was uh, collecting child abuse pornography online and going online pretending to be a woman with a child who they were offering up for other people to abuse John Venables became one of Britain's most notorious child killers. He's been sentenced to three years and four months in prison after pleading guilty to downloading over a thousand images of child sex abuse. Yeah, definitely did say, told you so. When he reoffended, I knew all along it was going to happen. I didn't know when it was going to happen, but it didn't happen. It, happened. it took him a bit of time, but he got there as a new reward. I'm hoping they are seeing through him now, and I'm hoping that they are realising that he is a danger, and he is a danger to society. But for everyone who says, you know, should let it go, why should I let it go? It was my son that he took. I'm never going to let this go. We just had all this done up for his birthday. It's just our little way of giving him something, really, isn't it? It just makes us feel better as a family as well, cos he knows he's not forgotten, he'll never be forgotten by us. I didn't think for one minute I'd be standing with a new family looking over the son that I lost. In the beginning, I didn't think I'd meet anyone else. When I first met Stewie, he, he, didn't, he didn't know I was James's mum. But once, we, once the wall comes down, you know, I couldn't have met a better man. He's just pulled me through so much. The day I married Stuart, the, Thomas was three months old and obviously we had Michael and it was such a lovely day and, you know, that day I couldn't stop smiling because I could see my family growing again. I'm Leon Fergus and I'm James' brother. I'm Tom Fergus, James' brother. Michael Fergus, James' brother. Being James' brother, it's not a weird thing. We've always grew up knowing he was there, who he was, what he was like, his character. In the household, we do, we talk about James a lot. We not pretend that he's there, but we talk about him as if he is there. So we will give us little stories and in, insights of what he was like. He's always been a character that we've wanted to know more about, wishing, wishing he was here, rather than just being someone that was in the background all this time. I was a baby in a sailor suit. Obviously, when it's on the telly, the five of us, we have a laugh about it. Obviously, you see yourself in a sailor suit, you think, 
one why he's on at me. Why? Well, obviously, she thought it was cute at the time, didn't she? It still is weird seeing about James on, on the news to this day. Obviously, it always will be. Because, obviously, I just, like, he should have been here with us. We shouldn't be looking at him on the news about a kid being murdered. We'd rather him be sat next to us. Growing up, obviously, what happened to James? Going through school, I wasn't really allowed on school trips. I wasn't allowed to go to the shops with my mates. So the only place I was allowed was either in the front garden or literally outside the gate to play with my mates, but it'd have to be in view of the window. So if I went out of sight, she'd be straight out. Where are you? What are you doing? Don't go down there. When I learned that them two were getting released, they, that was hard for me from to go to school then, because I thought, that, you know, what happens if they, they're outside the school waiting for them or whatever? Going up, like, if we were, like, walking around shopping and that, she'd always make sure she's at the back so she can watch us walk forward in front of her. She, she wants to know where we are all the time. It's horrible to say, but she didn't want that to happen again. She didn't want us to go out anyway, because obviously that will always be in the back of her head every day. And obviously it's scary to think that it could have, it could have happened again. You're going to be overprotective, aren't you, when something like that happens in your life? I think if I ever go to town with my mates, she's going to be worried sick. She texts me every five minutes. I can't even enjoy myself because she's always texting me. As a kid, you're a bit like, oh, but I want to do this, I want to do that. But obviously, growing up now, you'd understand why, why she was like that. We are a closer family, to be fair, because of what's happened. We do spend more time together than maybe some of the families would, just because we do want to, like, like cherish the time we have together, maybe. <laughs> what are you doing? You'll get there. <laughs> I've seen him growing into a young man now who's going to become a dad himself, so... Yeah, it's, it's a new chapter in our book. Through what's happened with my mum and James, as becoming a dad, seeing it from my mum's, seeing my mum's eyes, really, it is, it's going to make me more protective and hold the baby closer than you'd think anyone could. Well, I wanted James to be remembered as a little boy and not just the murdered child. So we set off a charity in his name. We started off with a caravan, but we've upgraded that now to a lodge. When we first set up the charity, we were like deciding what's the best way to go about it and to make it easier. We had like such a wide spectrum, didn't we? So. Families have gone through bereavement, a parent, a child, uh, kids that have been bullied, um, kids that have been victims of crime. We just wanted to give them a free holiday. I think James would be running up and down here because he, the first family holiday that we had with, with James was a caravan and he absolutely loved it. He loved it. So, I mean, just seeing the smiles on his face, remembering the smiles on his face, I'm hoping that we're spreading that to a lot of other kids that come here. I look back on this whole case with enormous sadness. James was let down by us, really, because, you know, his innocence was there for everyone to see. He was a two-year-old, so to see his innocence taken away from him like that is really, really sad when I think about it. I felt so totally helpless and I, I remember trying to keep it together. I think people feel guilty that they didn't stop it. It was just really, really sad. People could like, look at their kids and think, maybe just like, hug them tighter or something, because you don't know what could happen to that kid or to their child. 
He's always there with us. We're always there for him. I think if there is such a thing as closure, I don't think I'm going to get it sometime soon. At this moment in time, I don't see closure. Every single day, even after all these years, I miss him. I miss him growing up, I miss him, you know, going on his own little venture, whatever he'd become, do or whatever. Every single day without James, he's missed. She is one of Britain's most notorious serial killers, but growing up, were there clues revealing her murderous intent? Rose, Making a Monster is brand new Wednesday at 9. The battle of wits between security guards and shoplifters at war with the law goes up a notch as one thief comes prepared. That's next.